Hecatombs consisted of a hundred animals, and were offered by entire communities or by wealthy individuals who either deserved or had obtained some special favor from the gods. When a sacrifice was to be offered, a fire was kindled on the altar, into which wine and frankincense were poured, in order to increase the flame. In very ancient times the victim was laid upon the altar and burned whole, but after the time of Prometheus, portions only of the shoulders, thighs, entrails, etc. were sacrificed, the remainder becoming the perquisites of the priests. The officiating priests wore a crown composed of the leaves of the tree sacred to the deity they invoked. Thus, when sacrificing to Apollo, the crowns were of laurel, when to Heracles of poplar. This practice of wearing crowns was, at a later period, adopted by the general public at banquets and other festivities. On occasions of special solemnity, the horns of the victim were overlaid with gold, and the altars decked with flowers and sacred herbs. The mode of conducting the sacrifices was as follows. All things being prepared, a salt cake, a sacrificial knife, and the crowns were placed in a small basket and carried to the sanctuary by a young maiden, whereupon the victim was conducted into the temple, frequently to the accompaniment of music. If a small animal, it was driven loose to the altar. If a large one, it was led by a long trailing rope, in order to indicate that it was not an unwilling sacrifice. See footnote 194. When all were assembled, the priest, after walking in solemn state round the altar, besprinkled it with a mixture of meal and holy water, after which he also besprinkled the assembled worshippers, and exhorted them to join with him in prayer. The service being ended, the priest first tasted the libation, and after causing the congregation to do the like, poured the remainder between the horns of the victim after which frankincense was strewn upon the altar, and a portion of the meal and water poured upon the animal, which was then killed. If by any chance the victim escaped the stroke, or became in any way restless, it was regarded as an evil omen. If, on the contrary, it expired without a struggle, it was considered auspicious. At the sacrifices to the aerial divinities music was added, whilst dances were performed round the altar, and sacred hymns sung. These hymns were generally composed in honor of the gods, and contained an account of their famous actions, their clemency and beneficence, and the gifts conferred by them on mankind. In conclusion, the gods were invoked for a continuance of their favor, and when the service was ended, a feast was held. Oracles The desire to penetrate the dark veil of futurity, and thereby to avert, if possible, threatened danger, has animated mankind in all ages of the world. Prophetic knowledge was sought by the Greeks at the mouth of oracles, whose predictions were interpreted to the people by priests, specially appointed for the purpose. The most famous of these institutions was the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, which was held in general repute all over the world. People flocked from far and near to consult this wonderful mouthpiece of the gods, one month in the year being specially set apart for the purpose. See footnote 195. The priestess who delivered the oracles was called the Pythia, after the serpent Python which was killed by Apollo. Having first bathed in the waters of the Castilian spring, she was conducted into the temple by the priests, and was seated on a sort of three-legged stool or table called a tripod, which was placed over the mouth of a cave, whence issued sulphurous vapors. Here she gradually became affected in a remarkable manner, and fell into an ecstatic condition, in which she uttered wild and extraordinary phrases, which were held to be the utterance of Apollo himself. These the priests interpreted to the people, but in most cases in so ambiguous a manner, that the fulfillment of the prediction could not easily be disputed. During the ceremony, clouds of incense filled the temple, and hid the priestess from the view of the uninitiated, and at its conclusion she was reconducted in a fainting condition to her cell. The following is a striking instance of the ambiguity of oracular predictions. Croesus, the rich king of Lydia, before going to war with Cyrus, king of Persia, consulted an oracle as to the probable success of the expedition. The reply he received was that if he crossed a certain river, he would destroy a great empire. 
Interpreting the response as being favorable to his design, Croesus crossed the river and encountered the Persian king by whom he was entirely defeated, and his own empire being destroyed, the prediction of the oracle was said to have been fulfilled. Soothsayers, Augurs In addition to the manifestation of the will of the gods by means of oracles, the Greeks also believed that certain men, called soothsayers, were gifted with the power of foretelling future events from dreams, from observing the flight of birds, the entrails of sacrificed animals, and even the direction of the flames and smoke from the altar, etc. See footnote 196. Augurs. The Roman soothsayers were called augurs, and played an important part in the history of the Romans, as no enterprise was ever undertaken without first consulting them with regard to its ultimate success. Festivals Festivals were instituted as seasons of rest, rejoicing, and thanksgiving, and also as anniversaries to commemorate events of national importance. The most ancient festivals were those held after the ingathering of the harvest or vintage, and were celebrated with rejoicings and merrymakings, which lasted many days, during which time the first fruits of the fields were offered to the gods, accompanied by prayers and thanksgiving. The festivals held in cities in honor of special divinities, or in commemoration of particular events, were conducted with an elaborate ceremonial. Gorgeous processions, games, chariot races, etc., were conspicuous features on these occasions, and dramatic performances, representing particular episodes in the lives of the gods and heroes, frequently took place. We subjoin a few of the most interesting of the Greek and Roman festivals. End of section 19. Recording by Anthony Wilson.